Good morning. How's the family this morning? Man, the house is full, amen? Good having you all here this morning. Let's thank the band. Boy, they just bring it. Good to have you back, Nick. Appreciate it. You know, I, I, I always, I'm very observant to things uh, around me from time to time that catches my attention, and some of you may be the same way. I know people, I can walk in this building and I can see certain things out of place, uh, things that might be different than it was the week before. And I guess that's just in the management skills where I catch that because I've been in management all my life, so I see these little things and people tell me all the time, well, I, I don't know how you notice that or why you notice that. You know, we only move that thing over maybe a foot, you know, but I guess that's just in my DNA in management. But this past week, I... I noticed something that was very interesting. Now, i got a question for you. How many of you are coffee drinkers that drink coffee? There you go. Well, if you are, I need to share something with you. You need to be aware of the dangers of drinking coffee. You may not know the danger out there that you're putting yourself in by drinking coffee. And I noticed someone just recently drinking coffee, and they, they had an issue with it. And I'm not talking about how the caffeine's not good for you. Because I know all about that. I drink Dr. Pepper's and they've got caffeine in them. And you know, I know caffeine makes you hyper. I'm not talking about that. And I'm not even talking about that the caffeine or coffee might cause cancer if you drink too much over your lifetime. Not about that at all. I'm talking about the risk of just holding a hot cup of coffee. I also know that many of you want your coffee hot. Someone last week, something was going on, and they spilt a little bit of coffee on their hand, and it burned them. You know, it didn't burn them, burn them, but it burned them. And I thought, you know, what would they, what would they do if all that coffee was cold? You know, would they still drink it, or would it still bother them, you know? Or, or how, how does that work? And, of course, most people, I know they have all this new coffee out with all this stuff that you put ice in, you do the whole thing. But most people don't want coffee with ice in it. They want hot coffee. How many of you know this? Even if you're a non-coffee drinker or you're a coffee drinker, how many of you know, know if you spill a hot liquid on yourself and it's hot, it's going to burn you? Wouldn't everybody be aware of that and know that that could be a problem? And if you, of course, spill it on you, you're going to burn your skin. There's no, no way around that. A hot liquid will do that. You know, on February 27, 1992, many of you may remember this, Stella Lineback, a 79-year-old woman, ordered a 49-cent cup of coffee from the drive through window at a local McDonald's restaurant. Many of you remember that. Lineback was a passenger in the passenger seat of a car owned by her grandson. She was just a passenger. And her, son, her grandson pulled over because the car didn't have cup holders in it. So I guess it was the car's fault because it didn't have cup holders in it, but the, her, her grandson pulled over, and she had placed the, uh, placed the cup between her legs to hold it while she added cream and sugar. Now, the car was in park, but when she went to pull the lid off the coffee back toward her, she poured the whole cup of coffee in her lap, and it burned her. She had to go to the hospital. It, it, it burned her that much. Uh, she blamed McDonald's. She blamed McDonald's for the coffee being too hot and sued McDonald's and was awarded by a jury $2.7 million at the time. Now, the judge reduced that amount to $640,000, and as I read on, through some, uh, so it didn't go to appeal, and through some negotiations, you know, they settled out of court for a little under $600,000. I haven't figured out yet how a jury, 12 people, could come to a consensus that this was McDonald's fault. If she had drove through that drive through or one of us drove through the drive through and we got a cup of cold coffee, what would we do? We'd turn around and go back and chew somebody out because the coffee's cold. But this lady burned herself with hot coffee. The jury found she was only 20% at fault and McDonald's was 80% at fault. Boy, she had a good lawyer that he really talked it up. His, 
his deal was, and he argued to the point that that McDonald's had heated the coffee hotter than most restaurants would do. That that it it was hotter than most restaurants if you went through there, and that's why they caused the problem. And I guess it's, why is it in our society today that people don't use common sense? It's rampant everywhere. And they create problems for themselves, and then they want to blame everyone else but themselves when they create a problem for themselves. And that's ongoing in this society. On the side of this lady's coffee cup, it had a warning label. It said, this product is hot and can cause burns. It's on the cup. But does it need to be on the cup, guys, that drink coffee? When you go through there, do you expect anything else? Do they need to put a label on there that says, hey, this is hot, you might not want to burn yourself by spilling it? Common sense. I bought some lawnmower blades here recently, last year. And a label on the blade said, be sure and stop the motor, mower engine before installing the blades. I think I had that figured out before I started that procedure. I mean, that's how far out people have gotten. And that's how far, that's how far companies have to go right now to keep themselves from being sued over and over again. They have to grab each individual by the hand and lead them through every procedure they have to go through to know not to hurt themselves. Or they're going to blame somebody else. And this is just an ongoing problem. I read a story about a man who was blaming a company that makes irons. You know, the irons you iron your clothes with. And it was because he got burned by the iron. Seems he tried to iron his shirt without taking it off. And he was wanting to sue the people that made the iron because he burned himself ironing his shirt while he had it on. I didn't find out whether he won his suit or not, but to even bring a suit, you know, if nothing else, that just shows, what's that make you look like? I mean, that dumb award that everybody gets every year, you're right there, right? How can that take place? This year's presidential race is a good example. Good example. The losing party seems to blame everyone else and everything else for the loss, but at no point have they accepted responsibility for their loss. Both sides had issues, but the one that lost evidently had more issues. You know, I'm not making a political statement here. Don't anybody get me wrong. I'm just saying when it's self-evident that you played a big part of what went on, then don't blame everybody else for what happened. Don't blame the media. Don't blame Twitter. Don't blame all that. What did you do? Take responsibility. It's the same thing. So we're being led that way, just looking at our own government. Every day, we witness people who believe that it's never their fault. Do you know anybody like that? It's never their fault. It's always someone else's fault. They're blaming their actions on their childhood. They're blaming it on their parents. They're blaming it on their teachers. They're blaming it on their circumstance and anyone else besides themselves. I know people like that that do that every day. If anything happens to them in life at all, somebody else is to blame and they're going to sue somebody. You know, that's ridiculous. But that's how far our society has gotten. George Bernard Shaw, he was a winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1925. He stated, People are always blaming their circumstances for what they are. are. I don't believe in circumstances. The people who get on in this world are people who get up and look for the circumstances they want. And if they can't find them, they make them. Amen. If you don't like the circumstance you're in, change it. Because God gave you that ability and He gave you that choice and He gave you the way to go and make things happen besides sit around and cry and complain about everybody else. Oh, poor pitiful me. I hear that all the time. Oh, poor pitiful me. I can't make my car payment. I can't pay my rent. I can't do this and I can't do that. But I have a, I have a mobile phone. I have direct TV. I have satellite. I have internet. I have all that, but I can't live in the house where it's at. That doesn't make any sense to me. Blame somebody else, and it's their fault. It's either the car people's fault because they charge too much for the car, or it's the mortgage, the landowner, the mortgage that you're paying 
well, they, they're not giving me a chance here. No, it's always someone else's fault. And we never look within to see that it's our fault a lot of times that we bring stuff upon us. Sometimes others are at fault. And they need to know it. You know, if they truly are at fault, they need to know it. And they need to take responsibility for what they've done. But being able to accept responsibility when one is wrong means we actually become less helpless and passive. When you're not strong enough to take responsibility for what you've done or what you've created in a situation, then you look weak. You look weak. You should be able to be strong enough to say, I did that. I caused that problem. And I'll take the responsibility of it. And a bunch of us old redneck guys say, hey, I can fix that. So why not take responsibility for it? I screw stuff up all the time. I mean, that's just me. Ask my wife. She'll tell you. But you know what? I always look at it and go, well, I can fix that. Maybe I shouldn't have messed it up in the first place, but sometimes that's how we learn to do things, right? <laughs> we, learn, we learn how to mess things up and then turn around and get it repaired. So I learned something I didn't know in the past. So I look at the bright side of it. And that's how you have to be. You have to step up, take responsibility for what you do. If everything is someone else's fault, as most people claim, then what part do we play in our own life? Do we take any part of it? Should our actions be... Should the actions we take be entirely without any consequences at all? Anything you do, you're going to have a consequence for it, good or bad, right? So when something goes wrong, we, need, we still need to take responsibility for that. We live in a society today where responsibility is only acceptable for what goes right in life. And when things go wrong, the immediate time things go wrong, we tend to blame others for it. A man from Ohio was uh, cleaning his handgun when it went off and shot through his foot. He blamed the gun manufacturer for a defective gun. He said the trigger was too sensitive. I thought, how about making sure the gun wasn't loaded before you start cleaning it. That's where people's thinking us. I don't have any responsibility in it at all. That's why people get injured all the time. There was a family enjoying a day at a city park where they had a big pond there, and uh, they were blaming the city and wanting to sue the city because a wild goose there at the lake that they were feeding bread bit their son's finger. They said the city should have placed a sign warning people that the goose would bite. Go walking through Yellowstone and come up upon a grizzly bear and look for the sign that says this isn't a good deal. It's not going to be there. There are several examples in the Bible of people blaming others and how God dealt with them. And I'd like you to open your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 2, beginning at verse 15. Genesis chapter 2, beginning at verse 15. It says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Okay, right there, God gave Adam the rules. Adam knew what the rules are. We don't go there. We don't eat from this tree. This is a rule in my life. Okay, so let's move over to Genesis 3, chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good, 
good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her and ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Let's stop right there. God gave Adam and Eve a choice. He told them the rules, and then he gave them a choice. And Eve's sitting here being twisted by the serpent, going to try to lead her in the wrong direction, but she had a choice. She knew the rules, she knew she wasn't supposed to do this, but she made a bad choice, as we talked about last week. So, now the blame game starts. Let's pick up at chapter 3, verse 8. The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked so I hid. And he said, "Who, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? We have 13. Make sure I'm still. The woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. Okay, we're going to stop right there. The blame game started, right? Right there. The blame game started because Eve blamed the serpent and Adam blamed Eve, which blamed the serpent. So all at once, right here, we've created. At the, at, at the very start, we learn to blame others for what's going on in our life, right? Right there. Not only did sin come into the world because of Adam and Eve, they taught us how to blame one another for stuff or blame somebody else, right? Because that's where they're at. Let's pick up at, uh, we're still in chapter 3, Genesis, and we're going to go to verse 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will make your pains and childbearing very severe. With painful labor you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam he said... Because you listened to your wife and ate the fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and dust you will return." So death came into the world. So there were consequences that, they, that, that happened because of what they've done. Okay? Because of what they've done. So we, all, we understand they had rules. They had a choice. Then they started the blame. And then they, the consequences came for what they did. So not only, once again, did they bring sin into the world, they started the blame game right there at that time. Another example of the blame game is found in uh, Exodus. If you turn with me to Exodus, we're going to chapter 32, begin at verse 1. We know what's going on here, most of us do, that, that Moses has gone up on the mountain and uh, everybody's down waiting on him. He's been gone for a very long time and they get impatient. So we're going to pick up right here at verse uh, 1. When the people saw that Moses was so long and coming down from the mountain, they gathered, gathered around Aaron and said, come make, us, come make us gods who will be before us as this... <clears throat> As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol, cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods. 
Israel who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an, an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord, so that the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterwards they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Then the Lord said to Moses, make sure I'm at the right place here we go. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol, cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Okay, we're going to stop right there. Aaron listened to someone else. Aaron knew what was right and what was wrong. He knew the rules also. But he listened to someone else and he committed a sin by building and sacrificing to the golden calf. So Aaron's already created this thing going on and got himself kind of in a bind here. So let's pick up, let's move on down. We're going to pick up at verse 19. It says, When Moses approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, his anger burned and he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them to pieces in the foot of the mountain. And he took the calf the people had made and burned it burned it in the fire, <clears throat> burned it in the fire, then, the gr- the, then he ground it into powder, scattered it on the water, and made the Israelites drink it. He said to Aaron, what did these people do to you, that you led them into such a great sin? Do not be angry, my lord, Aaron answered. You know how prone these people are to evil. They said to me, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. So I told them, whoever has any gold jewelry, take it off. Then they gave me the gold, and I threw it into the fire, and out came the calf. Is that the way it happened? He, first of all, he blamed Moses. You know, basically, it took you so long to come back. We didn't think you were coming back. So it's kind of your fault. You know, you left us down here not knowing what to do, so it's kind of your fault. So he blamed Moses. And then he blamed the people. You know, they made me do it. How many remember those saying, the devil made me do it? Well, that's where he was. They made me do it. And then he blamed the fire. How far can you go when you can say, it popped right out of the fire? That's reaching. But he wanted to blame everyone else for what happened, but didn't want to take responsibility for what happened at that time. So it's, it's apparent that in the Bible, there were many people after Adam and Eve that had already learned how to blame other people for stuff that was happening around them instead of taking that responsibility. Remember the Pharisees? They blamed Jesus for leading a rebellion against their beliefs. They wanted to blame somebody else. They never thought for a minute he was the son of God. They never looked at the good things he was doing. They were blaming him for everything that was going on in their part. What it was creating them. So they're going to blame him. And of course have him crucified. See Christians, they're not exempt from the blame thing either. They also blame blame God. We find ourselves when we're in certain situations... The first thing we want to do, God, why are you doing this to me? God, why are you allowing this to happen to me? We want to blame God immediately, such as, you say these things. God, if I had more money, I would tithe. God, if I had a car, I could go find a job. God, if you'd sent me the right wife, my spiritual life would be better. And God, you created my children. I'm not a bad parent. I just have bad kids. Blaming God for what's going on in their lives. Blaming God because God didn't give them everything they wanted. God provides for everyone. When something goes south in your life, you shouldn't blame God. God puts trials in our lives to make us stronger. 
And I believe God puts trials in our lives so we'll take responsibility for those trials. And we learn. And we grow. And we grow in the need of Him. That we no longer think that we can handle it all. We actually turn to God for that guidance that's needed in our lives. Instead of blaming somebody else for it. Sometimes maybe God just wants to see how we'll handle it. Even though He already knows how we're going to handle it. Is it going to make us stronger? Or are we just going to push it off on somebody else? You know, in marriages today, the blame game's rampant. In every marriage, the blame game just goes wild all the time. The husband blames the wife. The wife blames the husband. If you want a strong marriage, then start taking responsibility for your own words and your own actions. Don't blame each other. I have some real good advice for you guys. No matter what, take the blame. I learned that. Because it goes nowhere. God is love. Amen? So if you love someone, even though you don't want this to go on and on, there's a better way to handle it, handle it than placing blame somewhere else. Amen? Don't immediately blame your spouse for what's going on in your life. God put that person in your life for a reason. And He expects you to love them. And He expects you to work together. You're a team. And if your marriage is not worked on being a team, you've got some problems you need to work through. But everything you need to do to prepare your marriage is right here in the book. Everything you need. And it starts with love. True love. That can change things immediately. The re reality in life is... We are to blame for many things. We really are. And if we don't seek God's direction or accept God's timing before we take that action, things are going to happen. So we should always call on God for His direction and wait on His timing for His answer. Be still, the Bible says. Be still and know that I am God. We don't, we don't do that. We don't do that good at all. We're moving all the time. Be still. That's hard in this today's society because we don't take the time to be still and wait on God. So that's why things go south in a hurry because we want it our way right then. And then when it goes south, we want to blame God or somebody else for that happening. Often we're quick to blame God when things go wrong and we're slow to thank Him when things go right. You ever notice that? We can find that time to blame Him, but we sure are slow about going over there saying, hey, thank you, Lord. You should thank the Lord for the trials in your life because you're learning something and it's making you stronger. And playing the blame game with God keeps us from understanding and appreciating the grace of God. We really can't have the concept or understand what it is God can do for us if we're always blaming someone else. And playing that blame game, putting it on somebody else never makes things better. It makes them worse. It always does. When we blame others, we avoid taking the responsibility for our actions, and that is displeasing to God. I read a story about a man that was in a hurry one day. He, he had been to church. He, he always attended church every Sunday. He, he was a devout Christian. He, he did everything right. But one day, he was late getting to work, one Monday morning. So he whips into this only parking place that was left because he was running late. And when he whipped in there, he turned his car too sharp, and he ran into the boss's car. Instead of taking responsibility for that, he decided that he didn't want to get fired or whatever was going to happen, so he backed out and went and found another parking place because he really didn't have... A scratch on his car. It just dented his boss's new Mercedes. So he didn't take responsibility. He went and found another parking place. Later that afternoon when everyone was getting ready to leave, a man was standing there arguing with the boss man because that man had pulled into that parking place and the boss 
was blaming him for the dent in his car. And this man's trying to defend himself, and all the time, this devout Christian man's sitting there watching what's going on. He knows what's going on. He knows this man is taking the blame for something he did. Did he do the right thing? The story didn't say. It's just an example of when we do something, how important it is that we take responsibility. Nobody will know. God knows. And that guilt you carry around after that, if you are truly a Christian, God won't leave you alone about it. It will come up in your dreams. It will come up in your daily walk. It will come up every time you go to work if you did something like that, right? Take responsibility. If it was an accident, it was an accident. This man should have just went and went and took care of it. His attitude was, well, he's got the money to drive a Mercedes, so he's got the money to fix his car. Wrong attitude. Wrong attitude at all. What do you think would happen if he went and admitted it wasn't this other gentleman's fault? He would have looked really bad, right? Once again, the story doesn't say what he did, but it puts a mental picture in your head to how things work when people don't take responsibility. When we blame God, we see Him incorrectly. We fail to see Him as a loving God who desires for us to start living in a blameless life. When Jesus hung on the cross, He didn't blame anyone. He didn't blame anyone at all for Him hanging on that cross. He had every right to. But He didn't. He accepted His responsibility given to Him by His Father. And remember what He said hanging on the cross. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. He knew what his responsibility was. And he knew blaming everyone else was not good. And it wasn't going to make it better. What he was doing and the responsibility he was taking hanging on that cross was about to make everything better. Shouldn't we be like Jesus? Shouldn't we think about that when we get ready to point the finger at someone else? Let's start taking that responsibility in our lives for our actions as Christians, whether we're, they're right or wrong. Let's stop blaming others for our circumstances and let's accept the consequences that comes along with things that happen. And better yet, let's call on God for the wisdom needed to make good decisions and the actions that we need to take. Call on God first. James 1 if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without fault, and it will be given to you. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for the blessings and favor you continue to show on your church house and your church family. Father, we thank you this morning that you sent each and every one of these individuals here this morning to be in worship for you. Father, we thank you that you've put them in our lives. We pray today that what was spoken here came from you, not from me. And Father, I pray today that we will start to look at things different. That Father, it is sometimes our fault. And when it is, I pray that we start to take the blame and accept the responsibility that goes along with that. Father, I pray that we're doing it right. And Father, I pray that we continue to follow you in your word, and accept your word and place it in our heart, Father God, where we know right from wrong. Father, I pray that you continue to lead us in the direction you'd have us go. Father, I pray today that we don't get ahead of you. Father, and we don't get too far behind you, but we stay right with you, Father, because we know you're the leader of our life. Father, I pray today that everything we said, everything we did here this morning, was uplifting, glorifying, and pleasing to you. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen.